All right. Since we have a lot of uh, talks today, I will try to uh, keep things a bit shorter. Um, so today, a serverless first first approach, or in short, will it Lambda? Uh, my name is Nick Den Engelsman. I'm a cloud solutions architect for BandLab Technologies. And today, I will mainly talk about our uh, flagship project or product, which is uh, BandLab. On the agenda, um, so why BandLab went serverless, with it Lambda, our first real-world migration, some lessons learned, uh, serverless live video streaming setup, and some Q&A. Um, but before we start, like, how many of you have tried the API Gateway and Lambda, for instance? And who is using it in production? It's a lot less, so. But it's still cool to see that everyone's interested. Uh, I will keep this short. So um, in the past, I used to work at a Dutch uh, uh, AWS partner uh, company. And in there, we did um, manage hosting solutions for, for clients. And my role was basically to educate clients and migrate them to the cloud. And this was way before serverless. So it was from 2011 until somewhere 2016. And um, what it involved was usually like looking at their current applications and identifying which parts needed to be changed in order to be uh, to, to support becoming highly available and fault tolerant. Um, and in turn, clients only wanted to worry about pushing code, and that's kind of similar of what we're trying to see achieve with serverless. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's it's kind of a big deal because we as a company needed to keep the infrastructure up to date, scalable, secured, patched, auto-scaled, and back then even there wasn't even Docker, so what we usually get was artifacts which we had to unzip, install dependencies, and then update the infrastructure, the auto-scaling group. So yeah, if you think about it, that's a lot of work, right? Um, so. <laughs> If we fast forward to 2015, 16, that's when API Gateway and Lambda was introduced as a combo and things really started to change, right? Everybody could see that this brings a lot of value and can change how we develop applications. And that's also why I uh, try to invest more time in these solutions. I asked my company if I could do some R&D and came up with a few example applications which really showed that it's totally possible to make uh, like a serverless backend which is highly available. It supports a lot of traffic right away and yeah, you can basically skip a few steps like setting up VPC, security groups, you name it, right? Um, I also started to invest my time in the serverless framework, so did some uh, contributions and tried to stay close with the community there and uh, the guys who are uh, contributing to the core. Um, so now, 2016, that's when I was given the opportunity to join BandLab. Uh, the BandLab platform, yeah, as, the, as it says, it's a music creation platform, so we're mostly dealing with audio objects and audio in general. So when I joined, there was really like this startup culture. Uh, things needed to move fast. The, the platform was gaining traffic. And the main value was bring like value to users each day, right? It wasn't really about making it high performance, fault tolerant. So surprise, surprise, they didn't set up auto scaling when I joined. So that's kind of a big deal if you're working on a platform and you estimate some huge growth. So um, there was definitely something that needed to change. Um, so looking back, at the earlier slide, some of the things we can now forget because of serverless. So highly available, it's taken care of. Uh, infrastructure up to date, we don't need to necessarily work up, think about that. It should be patched and auto-scaled by AWS. And the teams wanted to focus on the application, which serverless, at least it gives you more time, in my opinion, to work on the application and, and the, the features you want to bring out there to users than thinking about auto scaling, setting up the infrastructure, etc. So next topic, will it Lambda? 
So we decided like each time we wanted to migrate something that existed, we needed some sort of flow to identify like is this suitable for serverless, yes or no, or should we think about something else? And we came up with this. <laughs> it's very simple, right? <laughs> it's so simple, right? So the idea is you, you ask the question like will it lambda? Of course there's more behind that than just saying yes. And if it's no, we, we must try harder because the reason to try harder is that if you think about if you can get it working, it gives you so much more value and less, in my opinion, uh, operations is, is required in order to keep it out there and keep it running. And um, yeah, that's why we say try harder. Um, so I guess most of you are already a bit familiar with the limits of Lambda in, in general, uh, the concurrency. Uh, so by default, if you open a new account, you get a thousand concurrent lambdas, which is already quite a lot for most applications. Uh, there's the memory limit, the timeouts, of course. I will not name any, everything, but because it's already there. But there's more than just these default limits, right? So there's the option to choose runtimes. Today, it's already a lot better because of uh, the new introductions from reInvent to bring your own runtime. So that's awesome. Cold starts can still be an issue for certain applications. So yeah, you have to think about that. Then where do you want to keep your state? Is your, does your Lambda function even require some state? Uh, we usually go with S3 or Dynamo. RDS, to be honest, we don't, uh, right now we don't do much with VPCs and Lambdas because for us still the latency is too much and it requires this extra complexity with the uh, network interfaces where there's still limit and you can end up in a situation where your net network interfaces aren't cleaned up while still the traffic is growing and you don't want to have that. And then there's the other thing if you need like, if you're in a private subnet and you still want to make requests to the internet, you're paying this yeah, this amount of money for a NOT gateway uh, which is not very serverless, right? And then there's third-party binaries. So if you're thinking like, will it Lambda, you should also consider like, am I dependent on uh, native packages and uh, do I need to compile those? Again, there's something new, which is the Lambda layers, which somebody is talking about later, so that's nice. So that definitely solves a few things because now the community can also push out these shared layers, which others can depend on and it saves a bit of your time. So you don't have to, for instance, compile FFmpeg yourself. Um, next, so our first real world migration. Um, so what you see on this image is our, what we call our uh, mix editor. It works on, on uh, mobile and web. And the colored bars you see there are, those represent audio files. Um, so when I joined, we, had, we already had a service for, that, for this. This was hosted in Azure, it used Azure Storage as well. Um, but the idea was that we wanted to start with audio specific uh, services and we wanted to move them to uh, AWS because in Azure they were all hosted inside this monolith and we wanted to keep it more for the social part so it would only, yeah, concern about like doing a lot of HTTP requests and rather also doing like audio processing on the same, uh, auto scanning groups. Um, so we, again, we did the, the thing where we say like, will it Lambda? And there were things we, we needed to figure out, right? We needed to figure out if we could have uh, FFmpeg running inside Lambda. So this was like 2016 before even the Lambda layers and nobody was really doing that much with binaries. So it, yeah, it definitely took us some time to, uh, to get it compiled and working within Lambda especially with permissions and identifying where it is on the Lambda within the runtime environment. So there was this project, it's on GitHub still, it's, pretty, it's actually really good. It's called uh, LAMCI Lam and they have this Docker Lambda image. And what they tried to do was backwards engineer how the Lambda environment looked like and to represent it as good as possible. So we could use this Docker image uh, to compile FFmpeg inside and then we could copy it to our Lambda function and it worked just fine. Uh, we had to deal with a live endpoint for the migration. So there was already this API endpoint and we didn't want to introduce a new 
uh, puff because we couldn't update old mobile clients. So they would break if we would migrate it without taking care of uh, backwards compatibility. So the way we did that was, of course, we had uh, the, the domain already in root 53, but we used CloudFront with its path patterns. And by adding a new path pattern, we could do like during the deployment, take over this specific path and then redirect it to a different uh, application or in our case, an API gateway <coughs> endpoint. And we needed to worry about state and this was rather simple. We wanted S3 and Dynamo to, uh, to do the storage and Dynamo to do the fast lookups. Um, so this is sort of what it looked like back then. I tried to recreate it as good as possible from my memory, but the way it worked is like, if you see the blue line, that's basically the default origin going toward the Azure cloud. Um, the next line you see is going to an API gateway and it was using the, the, what I said, the cloud front path pattern to switch the traffic to go to an API gateway endpoint. Then we would have this proxy Lambda function which would know if it's a get or a post or put request. And if it, if it was a get request, it would first check in S3 if the audio object would be there. And if it wasn't, it would go back to an HTTP call directly to Azure, return the original response which was coming from Azure back to the client. And in the background, it would send this SNS message to trigger a downloader function which would then download the audio which was still on Azure. It would forward it to the bucket and the bucket then would be triggered, triggering this DSP function. We call it dig digital signal processing and it would then uh, generate different extensions of the audio file to support multiple mobile clients and put it in an, uh, another bucket where we store the formatted versions. So then the next time the same request comes in, it would be in S3 and basically the sample or the audio object would have been migrated from Azure. Uh, so once we had that running, we basically could support uh, like we had an, an on, like a, a living migration in process and we could run all the old requests of samples which haven't, hadn't been upgrade, uh, migrated. And since, yeah, the concurrency was pretty high, we could just run uh, thousands of get requests to in initiate this whole migration flow. Um, so some lessons learned from this. So our dream was to only ship or write code and ship it, but there's more to it because you still need ops, right? You still need to know if your function failed. So we used CloudWatch alarms in the beginning and then slowly moved into a different uh, route there, but which ended up being aggregated events going to Slack, which one of our engineers could uh, accept and then look into the issue. But saying there's still some, some work there. It's not about only writing code. Uh, the two states of every programmer. One day you think I'm a god and the next day you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is basically because either sometimes the doc documentation isn't up to date or you're testing this totally new AWS service which isn't generally available yet or it's just new and the documentation is different. Well, yeah, th that's, that's the state that you can end up in. And cold starts, yeah, you need to be prepared to defend like cold starts that they aren't an issue and that it's, uh, that you're willing to take the cold starts just because having a serverless setup in the end requires less operations. Uh, but once it's warm, then you can just throw whatever you want at it and it will just scale, which is very hard to do in the old setup, right? If you had to do it yourselves. So a few migrations later, our will at Lambda diagram look a bit like this. So who sees the difference here? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, ECS, we figured like for some, so some migrations or in general creating new services, some of them, it wasn't worth the effort to, to, to get it in Lambda like as I mean, you always want to, but in some cases it just wasn't worth the effort because it will be way more complex even or just way more time needed to develop it. So in this case, we use ECS to, uh, to still be sort of serverless with Fargate. 
But yeah, there's still more managers management because you, you need to create the Docker images and it's a bit more overhead, right? Um, so last topic, uh, serverless live streaming. And I think end of 2017, BandLab acquired uh, a platform called TV. It allows online video streaming, kind of like Twitch, but it was specifically aimed towards DJs. And since we are a, uh, a music collaboration platform, it, it was a good fit for us. But there were things we needed to find out, right? So their current infrastructure that, that, uh, that we bought, it, wasn't re it was scalable, but there were a lot of pieces which were uh, like uh, single EC2 instances with no failover. In general, the outcome was for us like video streaming, it requires servers and it's, it's, it's too difficult to, to get it serverless until we got a message from AWS saying that the Elemental Cloud would become uh, available to all customers. Um, so we did some experiments, right? So if, you do, if you're not aware about the Elemental Cloud from AWS, the products, what they support is basically this setup, which is exactly what we needed. So you have this live video coming in. Media Live would be this ingestion service, which takes the incoming video. It would then send as a, as a failover two streams, A and B, to uh, Elemental pack, yeah, Media Package. That's what we use. And Media Package is to distribute the video to clients. So it would do on the fly from media life to media package on the fly conversion to different uh, video formats. And this, is what, there was, this was exactly what we needed because that's, it was almost what we had running on Chew. Um, but of course we needed to do some research in order to, if we could uh, migrate it. Uh, there were some limits because Elemental, like having this setup working, uh, we did it through the UI uh, it took a lot of configuration to get up and running, and we couldn't auto scale this, right? So it's, it would be this manual creation of each of these streams for every user that wanted to stream on the platform. So what we did there was, um, yeah, there were more things actually. So the state we kept in Dynamo, we needed content moderation because on the existing platform, there were people streaming soccer or football matches and gaming which led to a lot of traffic. That's not the traffic we wanted, and it needed to be identified as soon as the video comes in. And CloudFront, so you can set up CloudFront with media package, it's default to the product, but in order to, to have it fast, like to have an endpoint up and running fast, CloudFront, we couldn't use the, the feature as it came. Uh, so what we did was we used Lambda Edge to still have one cloud from origin and then based on the, the path patterns or the paths, we would dynamically switch to these media package endpoints. Um, and auto scaling, we replicated, you can think of it as like auto scaling for EC2 or ECS. It works around CloudWatch metrics uh, and this decides like you have a min and a max uh, based on uh, percentages, so we tried to replicate that where for each input stream that was generated, we would keep track of this with CloudWatch metrics. Uh, we kept track of percentages and based on these CloudWatch alarms, we would trigger step functions, which would then make sure that there are always a few uh, video ingestion uh, setups up and running. So I will uh, go a bit faster. So step functions, if you haven't tried it, it's an easy way to, to co-locate multiple Lambda functions. And if you have a specific, it's, it's, it's just a state machine, right? So you can have different routes or you can have things triggered in parallel. But the most important part is from start to finish, each of these steps would pass the state to the next function. So, we'll, so you will always have the full state of the whole uh, trigger from start to finish, which is very useful if you're dealing with state and you want to have things uh, running based on, on maybe uh, timings or you want to add delays, that's also very nice. It supports retries logic, delay logic, all within step functions itself, so you can remove all of this logic from your Lambda functions. Uh, I will do a quick demo, if there's still some time, to show you how the video streaming is working in action. Uh, if it's not, 
We're still working on the, on the actual delivering of the migration for Chew TV. The feature is already live on BandLab itself, but you have to be a beta user. So if you're on the platform and you want to try this feature, just uh, send me a message and I can see what I can do for you. Uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Questions? I wanted to say, well, getting FFmpeg running in Lambda, you just need a static build of it. Correct. This, I think, fine. Yeah, but still, I think it's a good pros process to at least try it yourself so you get used to the <coughs> limits. Uh, and definitely with layers, it's, it's getting way easier, which is awesome. Yeah. Other questions? When you use FFmpeg, mm -hmm. How do you prevent your lambda function from hiding? Uh, so in our case, um, so the, the, the part which you saw where, for which we did the migration, is, it's mo mostly about smaller audio objects. So it's, it's always within a fixed limit. So our mix editor goes to something like 10 minutes at max. So each track can be te 10 minutes long max. And it would be a lot of maybe small samples on a specific track. Uh, so it still always fits within our uh, limit. But let's say if we wanted to move to, um, I don't know, podcasts as an example, right? Uh, you can, I tried it once, you can do like input and output buffers. You can actually, from what I tried, I tried a, like a two gigabyte video and it would use input buffers from S3 directly and output buffers directly. And then Lambda is just being used as this proxy and then you wouldn't hit, for instance, the, the local storage limit. It's, I mean, it was experimental, but it worked. Um, other questions? Oh. Just one very specific question, because I didn't see you recently. So when you, uh, you did a lot of lambda character there. So when you, when you uh, put a lambda function, right, there's always a, Some sort of like after you do it all. I'm going to give it back once the function is taken off, right? Yeah. I couldn't find anything where you can get a call back saying call this function when you, when you take it off. Yeah, so you're, what you're saying is like if Lambda would have a feature where the moment you triggered, let's say, the callback to whatever was calling it, that you would still have some time to do some after logic? Yeah, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. But for now, yeah, the only thing you can do, no, you, the only thing you could do is like doing it right before the, the callback. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, so our goal is always to, to make it serverless first. And if, if it really doesn't work or it takes too much time, then we would default to ECS. Um, so, so the, yeah. So, yeah. So one of them was like what you mentioned. If if what if the t the function wouldn't be able to run the FFM pack in let's say five or fifteen minutes, that's always a thing we're looking into. Of course, you can do things like. For instance, do it in chunks or in parallel and then have one thing which joins everything together. That's possible, so that's something you could do with, uh, with step functions. But sort of like defeats the purpose where you just want to, to build your application and ship a feature. And if you're, you're already seeing like this, what is, it makes the effort times three or whatever uh, goal you have there. That's the point like where we are like, nah, it's, it's probably not worth the effort. Uh, but to be fair, it, for us, it, for, it hardly ever ap happens. 
The only issue we had was, for instance, local storage size. So we have one process. So we, now we only talked about the individual audio objects. But our mix editor supports 10 tracks to 10 minutes. And to like mix all of these layers into one final uh, output, it would do all the mixes for each track. And then it would uh, like mix everything onto one track and apply maybe a an, an final effect, like some reverb. Like this whole process, at one point we had it working in Lambda. It took us a lot of time and effort to, to have all the states. Um, and it became so complex and we would still hit the issue as soon as we wanted to go from five minutes to 20 minutes. We knew that the issue would come back. So that's when we decided like we are just going to move this to ECS. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're also running on the Azure uh, cloud for the Azure functions as well. So most of their, like all the new new services are being built also in a serverless uh, manner. Yeah. But me personally, I, have, I don't have that much experience in, uh, in Azure cloud. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.